Good morning and welcome to this session. This morning is for me a real pleasure and honor, I would say, to receive in Howard University, Ellen Clark. He's a real personality in the world, I would say. And I would like to thank uh, to make some space in her busy agenda to share this uh, session with us. Also, I would like to thank uh, Professor Federico Mayor and all the, all the components of the Institute of Demos Past, the Institute of Human Rights, Democracy, Culture, Culture Peace, and Non-Violence. That nowadays is a critical issue for all the society in general and specific, specifically for the university. I think that the Agenda 2030 is a real opportunity to change, to change the things in the world that are going not so well, I think. And I also firmly, firmly believe that the, the university has to play an essential role in the implementation of the su sustainable development objective in this uh, 2030 agenda. So welcome to Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, Helen. I will say, pass the, the word to, to Professor Federico Mayor for make the presentation. Madam, it's a great pleasure on behalf of uh, all the members of the Institute, Demos Paz, and we are, have here our most important personalities, our rector, uh, and uh, all the present to welcome you uh, to uh, the Autonomous University of Madrid. I was telling you uh, before uh, all the advantages of this uh, uh, very, very important university at the European level. And uh, you are, I think, the best reference for the title of this uh, meeting today, because that, uh, we are going to address the uh, gender issue, the gender equality, and at the same time the uh, Agenda 2030, that is very interesting. It's the first time that many countries, all the member states of the General Assembly, have said is to transform the world. I think that is the first time that you can read in one resolution of the United Nations this uh, beginning, to transform the world. What we must do to transform the world? And you know this very well because you have been during many years, not only the uh, Prime Minister of Zealand, New Zealand, but you have been also one of the most important members of the uh, United Nations system. And now we need to reinforce, please, we need now your experience and your advice in how we can reinforce the multilateral democratic system. Because, as uh, you know, uh, we are in a moment in which uh, without uh, the support of the most important countries, even Europe, Europe that uh, was a, at a given moment a very important support. You had in Europe persons also a women like Groharlem Brundtland, for example, that were very important also for UNDP. And now we need uh, uh, to redress the present uh, uh, lack of solidarity that... Uh, we have at the European level. Therefore, you are the person that represents better the gender equality and at the same time the United Nations system because you have been during so many years a person so uh, uh, important in the context of the United Nations. And, um, you know, from the very beginning I thought that the G7 uh, at the beginning even was the G6 after the G7, the G8, the G G20. How, how can we accept to have the governance of the world in the hands of uh, six, seven, or 20 uh, states when we are more than 196? Therefore, uh, you are very welcome here because we are addressing in your presence uh, these two very important issues. I think that what... Uh, uh, President Nelson Mandela told me, and I like to repeat in the 1996, he told me, uh, because when I told him, you know, uh, President, uh, the culture of peace has not a lot of success. And he told me, don't worry, because the women that are the cornerstone of the new era will, uh, in some years' time, they will uh, make 
the culture of peace uh, worldwide. And uh, I look at him and saying, why? And he told me, because women only exceptionally use force. Men only exceptionally do not. <laughs> Madam, you are very welcome. You come from the other part of the globe, of the planet. But you have been, in this also, you have been very surprising because you were from New Zealand, but you were very often throughout the world. You were very often in Europe. And, uh, you know, when I was uh, uh, thinking what I can uh, tell her, tell uh, to you that we are very close to New Zealand. Because for me it was very impressive when one of my friends, Roberto Sabio, that is also a very distinguished journalist at the world scale, uh, he told me that he was in visit in China many years ago when Chu Enlai was there. And uh, he, he told me that when he arrived as a young man of Italy, he told, uh, Mr. President, I, I am very happy. Uh, China is wonderful, but it's too far. And Chu Enlai looked at him and said, far? from where. <laughs> therefore, therefore, <laughs> at this moment, at this moment, we are very close to everywhere and we are very happy that you are here today with us. Thank you. This is Clark. Uh, former, minister, uh, former Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of UNPD. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Uh, I am Manuela Mesa, uh, co-director of the Institute of Human Rights, Democracy, Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, together with Carlos Jiménez, that is in the other side of, of, of there. Uh, and also uh, uh, with us is uh, Cristina Sánchez, that she is uh, the director of the Women's Study Institute. And we are going to, all together, we are going to raise uh, some questions. Uh, and also, we would like to, to, after that, give the floor to the audience. Also, to, you could make some, some questions and to use this uh, wonderful opportunity to have Ms. Clark with us. So, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for, for, for us to have you in the university, the Autonomous University. Our president, Rafael Garese, he has to leave uh, in 10 minutes, I think, so he apologized for, for that. Uh, and then, because we don't have many time, we, we know that at, at one we have to finish. So let me start with, with a question about uh, women uh, and leadership. We know that everywhere in, in the world, we see women are not fairly represented in the political, economic, and educational sphere. They are neither at the top table nor in the decision-making processes. So you are a reference person for many women. So based on your personal experience, what have been the factors, the, the drivers that have allowed become Prime Minister of New Zealand and holding three terms? Because many women that are in power just one term and then they don't want to, to mm. come back again. Mm. So we would like to start with that. <laughs> Well, muchas gracias, and thank you to the, uh, the rector and the president of the institute and for welcoming me and for everyone who's come today. And thank you to the university for agreeing to, with the New Zealand Embassy, mount uh, the, the session. Uh, this is a special year for New Zealand with many activities around the 125th anniversary of New Zealand becoming the first country in the world where women won the right to vote. I was in Colombia last week and they said in a province in Colombia in the late 19th century, women could also vote, but it never went countrywide. So we claim the, being the first country 125 years ago. And uh, as uh, indicated in the, in the question, uh, yes, uh, New Zealand uh, is now having its, its third woman prime minister. I was the second, there was one before me. Uh, and for more than half the last 21 years, New Zealand uh, has had uh, women, women prime ministers. So, I mean, what has made this possible in New Zealand? Because it doesn't happen so often around the world. We can look at, at Iceland, which has had an elected woman president and two prime ministers. We can look at the British Crown Colony of Bermuda, off the coast of North Carolina, which has had three women premiers. We can look at Norway, with 
two women prime ministers, UK with two, but, but three is kind of you know, leading edge, so we're, 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 we're proud of that. Uh, I think um, the votes for women in 1893 uh, came with a rather progressive government. This was uh, a government which also uh, uh, introduced what I think was the world's first industrial conciliation and arbitration legislation, uh, mediation between employers and, and workers by statute, the world's first old age pension, the world's first workers' public housing. Uh, it did quite a lot of pioneering things and, and votes for women were very much in the, in the context of, of that. Uh, New Zealand at the time was a country where where women worked extremely hard alongside men, establishing farms. Uh, indigenous women worked hard alongside uh, men. And the women mobilized across the society, rich and poor, indigenous and, and settler, to say we deserve to have a say in the decisions uh, made for our country. And the remarkable thing is that in 1893, an all-male parliament agreed to this. Now, one can then reflect that you know, maybe progress wasn't so fast on gender equality beyond that. There was no uh, possibility for women to be candidates until 1919. The first woman was elected in 1933 to the New Zealand Parliament. And even when I arrived in the Parliament in 1981, only 9% of the members were, were women. But I think in New Zealand, it's a small country. When ideas catch on, they, they get traction. And so we can see these first political steps taken 125 years ago. We can see uh, gradually women entering the decision-making sphere. Uh, my generation, which we refer to as the post-World War II demographic, the baby bulge or boom of, of that time, we were the ones who crashed through a lot of the glass ceilings to leadership across the society. Um, that was a second wave of feminism, if you like. And I think the third wave now in New Zealand is very much looking at uh, remaining issues. Uh, the pay gap still, the 9.2% gap between men and women's pay, and definitely the issue of sexual and gender-based violence, which worldwide is captured in the Me Too uh, uh, hashtag. Uh, but is a, is a factor in every society on earth, in, in including ours. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're proud of what's been achieved, but we still say some way to go. Uh, we have not had a cabinet like Spain, which is 51% uh, uh, women members, which is uh, quite, quite phenomenal. Uh, we need to get there. Our parliament is um, close to 40% female now, and parity is within, within grasp. Uh, but maybe I should conclude this comment by referring uh, to the president of the Institute's reference to President Mandela, because he was right. You know, women are the hope. If we can get more women into decision-making uh, positions around the world, we will get decisions which are more reflective of the needs and aspirations of the 50% of the population, which is female. And one of Mandela's many great legacies was to leave South Africa with a strong constitution and rule of law in which is embedded the absolute principle of gender, gender equality. Uh, and we should thank him for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Out of our government now that we have uh, a number, a great number of, of women, and we would like to move to sustainable development goals and 2030 agenda. Uh, we know that uh, you have involved deeply mm. in the definition of the 2030 agenda, mm. and it says that they cannot be sustainable development without gender equality. Mm. But now we are now more than three years into the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. And I would like to, to ask how to make progress on the uh, SDG, partic particularly around gender equality and women empowerment. 
and connected with that, with that, how far have we come in carrying the 2030 agenda into results for women and girls on the ground? Uh, what is needed to bridge the remaining gaps between rhetoric and reality? Because mm. there are many rhetoric about gender and, and a few facts. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think uh, you know, we're, we're three years into the sustainable development agenda and the, the progress is not spectacular. Uh, I would anticipate in two years' time at the General Assembly there will be a high-level event at the five-year mark uh, and then hopefully minds will begin to focus on what is needed to drive uh, the agenda forward on, on gender equality and uh, across uh, the other aspects. But of course, <laughs> if you can't achieve gender equality, you're not going to achieve these SDGs. You know, what is the bottom principle of them? Leave no one behind. If you are leaving 50% of the population behind because they're less, uh, less paid, uh, more vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence, less represented in decision-making, you're not going to achieve these goals, whether it's across healthcare or education or eradication of poverty or, or whatever. Uh, so, you know, as Hillary Clinton once famously said, gender equality is not just the right thing to do because it is a human right, and this year we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it's also the smart thing to do because if countries aren't fully engaging the energy and participation of, of women and, and enabling women to make their own choices over their lives and fulfil their potential, then frankly, countries aren't going to do anywhere near as well as they could either. So what do we need to do that goes beyond uh, the, the rhetoric? Uh, firstly, I think the, the political empowerment is, is absolutely critical. We need more women in decision making at every level. You know, I really applaud the you know, new Spanish government for putting a stake in the ground on that. But I was just in, in Colombia, which has elected a conservative president. He has appointed 50% of the cabinet as women. So this is happening in political systems across the, the spectrum, which I think is very encouraging. Good, you know, good examples we can hold on to to say, they could do it, what, what's wrong with you? Really make way uh, for, for, for women to come forward uh, in, in these systems. Uh, in parliaments, the global average of uh, women's representation is 23.4%, which is really obviously far, far too low. And there are many things that countries can do to boost representation. And in a number of countries, uh, the fastest progress has been made when they have brought in quotas. Uh, and then you, you force the issue. Uh, some of the quotas may have uh, uh, what we call sunset clauses. So you may say have a quota for three electoral periods or whatever, and then when you've established the habit of women's representation, maybe you withdraw the special measure. But quotas definitely work and should be tried if nothing else uh, uh, works. Uh, then there's the issue of, of economic empowerment, where a lot more could be done. And in this respect, I think we, we also need to highlight the fact that 155 countries around the world have some kind of law which discriminates against women. Uh, the World Bank does an annual report called Women, Business and the Law, as I recall. And last year's uh, report uh, talked about this concept of domestic economic violence, by which they mean women not being in full control of their economic resources. So a man will take their pay packet or take the money they earned at the market or not permit them to, to borrow money or, or access, you know, to actually get ahead as perhaps a small farmer or micro-entrepreneur. And their figure was that around the world, 1.4 billion women suffer from this domestic economic violence, which is quite a, quite a staggering uh, figure. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, Spain is a, a good development partner, right, and, and very affirmative of women's empowerment in, in what it does internationally. I think focusing on some of these legal and often cultural barriers to the full empowerment of women is, is going to be extremely important to breaking through uh, on uh, women's empowerment. Then let's raise the next thing, which is sexual and reproductive health and rights. 
uh, where women uh, are not able to choose who they marry, if they marry, when they marry, if they have children, if they do, how many and how they are spaced. What hope have women of being able to determine their future? These are absolutely basic rights, and they're rights where the, you know, the battle is not won globally. Heavens, it's not won in the United States where the recent appointment of the Supreme Court could see a reversal of the constitutional right to abortion, which was established in the Roe versus Wade decision all those, those years ago. And uh, as, as I think you would be aware in Spain and in, in, uh, in Latin America, uh, these rights are far from established in, in most countries. So, you know, I see this as really basic to, to women's empowerment and to meeting uh, you know, the full potential of the sustainable development uh, agenda for, for women. And then I think my, my final uh, uh, point uh, would be uh, to say that violence against women is a blight against women reaching their full potential. If a woman is not safe in her home, if she's not safe in her community, this is a constraint on their ability to reach their, their potential. If they are living in fear, fear of violence from uh, an intimate partner, uh, fear of violence in the, in the streets of their community, and this has to be tackled uh, by all societies that are interested in the full empowerment of, of women. So I think, you know, on the SDGs overall, there's so much that can be done. Uh, I think, you know, international and national attention is often easily distracted from these long-term, hard grind things that need to be done uh, to, reach, uh, to reach goals. And let me just say on the, on the progress report on the SDGs that has come most recently from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, well, it, it's clear we're not on track. Uh, they are saying that in particular, uh, conflicts which are forcing displacement around the world, whether we're talking Venezuela, Syria, or wherever, and also now the accumulating uh, effects of climate change are huge barriers to the SDGs, huge barriers. Um, I saw also another assessment in the uh, Overseas Development Institute uh, report from the UK where they say that to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, which is what the agenda says, and a majority of the extremely poor uh, women, by the way, uh, to eradicate that, uh, the forecast GDP growth rates in poor countries would probably halve the extreme poverty rate, right? So if you have roughly 800 million extremely poor people in the world today, by 2030, just on those economic trends, you will halve it. But the other 400 million will still be there under the poverty line unless, they say, there is a massive international solidarity investment, in particular, in health, education, and social protection, because you have around 48 low-income developing countries, a number of which uh, would be classed as fragile states, which will not have the money to do those things which would enable extreme poverty to be eradicated. And when you look at those areas, health, education, social protection, a failure to invest in those will of course make achieving SDG 5 on gender equality extremely difficult. So it's really a call for solidarity to the Spanish development budget, to everybody's development budget to be focusing on these things. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for these concrete ideas mm. about mm. how to go further mm. with this mm. uh, 2030 agenda. I give the floor to Professor Cristina Sanchez. She's going to raise all mm. some questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm the director of the Women uh, Research Institute, and uh, it's really an, an opportunity to know more about gender and politics <coughs> based on your experience. And I would like to ask you about uh, the presence of women in politics. First, um, when women are in, in the career, what makes the difference when women are at the highest levels of leadership? 
Do they incorporate new ways of leadership, new skills, and new values? And my second point is, um, what's happened with women in politics when they leave their position? Are there differences between men and women in this situation? Do they have similar opportunities in terms of recognition, professional, and finance, financial success? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, many, many issues we could explore <laughs> in that. Um, firstly, I think in principle, it's important that women are in leadership, in principle. Because then when girls and young women are looking at those in leadership, they can say, that reflects me, right? If all you see in leadership is a sort of a row of suits <laughs> of men and you don't see yourself, well, how does this relate to you? Are these people caring about me? Could I ever be that? And, you know, the, I mean, the truth is that you know, not, not all countries uh, have, in fact, very few countries have ever had women leaders. But, you know, you take a country like New Zealand now, which has a 37-year-old woman prime minister, uh, not married to her partner, who has just had a baby, took six weeks maternity leave. Her partner, uh, a young man, is taking a year off work to look for the baby. What an incredible role model this is. Young women can look at this and say, well, yeah, that, that could be me. This affirms my choices, you know, that I want to, to do a range of things and my expectations of my partner. So, you know, it, it's important to be able to see yourself in, in these leadership role models. Now, uh, then there's the issue of do women in leadership do anything for, for women? Well, the answer is some do, some don't. You know, we can think of uh, Margaret Thatcher. We don't particularly think of uh, progress for, for women. Uh, uh, so yes, you know, it was good in principle to see a woman leader, but you wouldn't have said she was particularly committed to an agenda for women. Uh, but on balance, I believe uh, that women leaders uh, do deliver uh, for women where they can. Of course, they're also conscious that they're representing whole societies. But when you have women in leadership and then the significant numbers in the cabinets and the parliaments, issues begin to get addressed which weren't on the agenda before. Uh, and, that, and that's important. You know, different things are prioritised. I think back to things I was proud of being able to do um, as a minister and, uh, and then which my government did as, as prime minister. You know, when I was Minister of Health, I introduced the first nationwide cervical screening programme. This had not been done uh, before. Uh, started uh, the pilots for breast cancer screening, hadn't been done before. Uh, sponsored legislation to make the practice of midwifery autonomous rather than always under the, you know, the, the, the say-so of, a, of a, a medical practitioner who was usually male. Uh, in government, able to, you know, uh, take forward uh, paid parental leave at the time of a new baby as a legal entitlement. We'd never had that before. Uh, an absolute legal entitlement to uh, 20 hours a week uh, free uh, daycare for, uh, for children, for three and four year olds. So there's, there's lots of things you can do as a woman leader which are you know, very positive for, for women having choice and autonomy and, 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 and so on. So it's a bonus when this happens, but it, but it, it, it does tend to happen with most, most women leaders. Now, what happens with women in politics when they leave their position? Well, this is an interesting question. In my country, uh, you know, we have had two women prime ministers who've left, left politics, me and the lady who came before me, Jenny Shipley. Now, we took completely different paths. She has taken a commercial path, uh, boards of directors and, and so on. Uh, I've taken a public good path, right? So I'm sort of out there as, a, as an advocate and I support good causes and uh, active on social media and attend a lot of conferences and events and exchange ideas and experiences and try to you know, rally support for things I'm passionate about. And there's quite a, a number of those which uh, stretch across areas of central interest to this institute sustainable development, gender equality, and so on. So in a way, it may depend on the women. What, what is their, their inclination? Uh, will they go into you know, a post-politics incarnation 
uh, reincarnation, which is uh, in the public good area, or will they follow the path that men more often take, not entirely, but more often, uh, of going down a commercial route with boards of directors? Mm -hmm. And the, my other question is about the Me Too movement, especially because we have here uh, many young women, and I would like uh, to know how do you think that this movement can continue? What should be next steps in order to produce social and political changes in favor of gender equality? Mm -hmm. And do you think that we are uh, really in front of a new wave of feminism, in this case, the fourth wave of mm. feminism? Mm. Yeah, uh, d definitely I think it, it, it's a new wave, whether it's the, uh, sometimes described as the third wave in my country, but maybe it's the fourth wave in, in Spain. Uh, but I'm very supportive of the Me Too movement because the, the truth is that what is coming out uh, from sectors across the society actually reflects the experience of many, many women. Uh, when it first came out in the United States with Harvey Weinstein and the, the film sector, you know, around the world there will have been young actresses and young people trying to make their name in directing who will have been under pressure from powerful men in the industry, uh, powerful sexual and gender-related rate of violence pressures. And then it spread from that sector, obviously, to a range of other areas. I've seen hashtag Me Too has, has emerged in China on their social media sites. Sometimes it's closed down, sometimes it's not. Uh, but there, there's an awareness there. In, in my society, uh, it has been most prominent in the law profession, and in particular in one major law firm where the most disgraceful behaviour had gone on with senior uh, partners and lawyers with respect to young uh, women lawyers and, and interns. And then it was also exposed that, that this culture really began with some of the law students' associations and their behaviour. Uh, and, and it's been called out. Now, unless, uh, you know, women come forward and you know, it's, it takes a lot of courage to come forward and say these things, it would not be uh, not be exposed and then becomes harder to deal with. Now, probably what is also on people's minds is what happened in the Senate of the United States over the last couple of weeks. Those women were so brave to step forward, and it is really quite extraordinary that this uh, once over lightly FBI investigation didn't call key witnesses uh, around that, that judge. And you now, you know, I, I say thank goodness in my country the judiciary is not politicized because this has been a disgraceful performance where someone has been pushed through uh, for, for political reasons uh, uh, without any you know, proper or full examination of whether he is a fit and proper person. And in my country, what the Legal Practitioners Act says is that to hold a position in the law, you must be, quote, a fit and proper person. Well, you know, some of the allegations we've seen <laughs> made about uh, senior legal and judicial figures would indicate they are not fit and proper people. And it is then a concern to the whole administration of justice if people who are not fit and proper uh, are holding uh, prominent positions. So, yeah, I think you know, the Me Too movement is extremely important. Clearly, uh, it, um, it has a way to run because the issues are, are very live. And there's a backlash, right? And uh, it's interesting to me that in the political debate about this in the US over the Supreme Court appointment, uh, now we will probably see a backlash against those who supported the judge, uh, who say, you know, fantastic, we got one over those, those women, and there'll, there'll be a backlash in support of him, uh, unfortunately, from you know, a, a, a number of men, whether it's minority or majority, remains to be seen. But, but there will be a backlash. So we, we have not won these battles that you know, women have a right uh, to be safe from, that, you know, from behavior 
uh, which is uh, violent on the basis of, uh, of, of gender. Thank you. I give the floor to Professor Carlos Jimenez. He's going to raise uh, another question. Mm. Thank you very much, Helen, for these inspiring answers mm. and comments. Um, now, we would like to connect the gender quality and development with cultural diversity. Cultural diversity. Uh, you mentioned uh, before the indigenous people. Let me go ahead in this perspective. As you know, today in the world, one of the most important challenges and debates is how we can, can we manage cultural diversity, linguistic, religious, ethnic, nationalism. That's our problem. It's a common problem. OK, New Zealand was and is a positive reference in the world for its politics. My question, our question is from the perspective of intercultural dialogue and gender equality, how do you assess the multicultural public policies of New Zealand and more specifically those related to the Maori people? Mm. What is your experience in that important mm. challenge? Mm. What do you learn as the Prime Minister, please? Well, it's, it's an interesting question to be uh, <laughs> raised in Europe at this time when we see the the, the politics of what have been quite liberal democracies turned on their head by the emergence of you know, uh, far-right parties uh, which are completely opposed to, to diversity. And we're, we're seeing that from you know, Sweden to Germany to Denmark to the Netherlands to Italy to you know, Hungary to what, whatever, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue and, and one that the European Union has to hold the line on because if European values mean anything, it means tolerance, democracy, inclusion, right? But it, it's increasingly a hard line to be drawn in, in, in Europe. Uh, now, the New Zealand experience is a, a little different. <laughs> uh, New Zealand is perhaps the only uh, country to be colonised by Europeans uh, where the, the state acquired its legitimacy from a treaty signed in 1840 between a representative of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom and the Maori chiefs of New Zealand. Most Maori chiefs, not all, but some, but most. Uh, and that treaty set out that in, in exchange for the extension of the sovereignty of the Queen and the rule of British law to New Zealand, Maori accepting that would have their land, fisheries, and forestries protected. That was 1840. Now, of course, then settlers poured in largely from uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, this was quite, quite devastating to Maori, and there were a lot of uh, not very ethical land deals done. Uh, and there were some tribes which didn't sign the treaty, which then there was war between them and the British forces and they lost their land. So over a period of, you know, a long, well, a long time throughout the 19th century, uh, a lot of the undertakings in the treaty were not honored. And this became an issue of growing concern within Maoridom and, you know, eventually, uh, you know, the government, well, a government is elected which starts to listen a little more to this. And to cut a long story short, from the uh, early 1970s, New Zealand appointed a tribunal uh, with the name of this treaty, the Waitangi Tribunal, relating to the Treaty of Waitangi. But more interestingly, from the early 19, or well, mid-1980s, this tribunal was empowered to go back to 1840 to look at grievances under the treaty. So if, if uh, tribes said, look, you know, 
here's this treaty, but here's what happened to us, right? This is not in the spirit of the treaty, and we are seeking redress. And so the process started of major uh, investigations and reports, and the first tribe which negotiated on the basis of one of these reports a settlement with the government was the tribe which had had the land confiscated as a result of the wars, and they got a very substantial settlement. Now, over the, the last, thir last 20 years or so, 25 years almost, these settlements have been coming through as the government engages tribe by tribe with the issues and particular grievances that they have dating back to colonization. And a settlement uh, usually involves an apology for wrongs done. It usually involves a cash settlement, and there's sort of a you know, formula for that. It may also involve restoration of lands and forestry. On fisheries, um, going back uh, more than 20 years, there was an historic uh, settlement with Māoridom as a whole, where Māori came uh, to own half the fishing quota. Now, I know Spain understands about fish. You're a great fishing country. <laughs> so New Zealand has the fifth biggest exclusive economic zone in the world. So if you own half the fishing quota, this is a very substantial economic base. So as a result of all these things, uh, Māori uh, have seen their economic base transformed. Uh, they have become substantial uh, owners of companies, investors, owners of land, forestry, fisheries. Um, and also there has been a significant cultural renaissance. Uh, for example, my government uh, funded uh, what is quite successful Māori television. Now, why was, uh, I mean, this actually was the subject of one of these reports uh, from, I think, the Waitangi Tribunal, which said that there was an obligation to um, <clears throat> encourage the development and maintenance of the Māori language, because like many indigenous languages, it was endangered. Uh, and so to fulfill that obligation, we, we funded the channel. We, I mean, it's not commercial, right? But it's an indigenous language and culture nationwide television channel, which, which does very well, I might say. Uh, the, the government has also, in New Zealand, uh, funded many initiatives in education on language. Uh, there are uh, independent Māori schools which teach fully in Māori. They are publicly funded. Uh, within the public school system, there are immersion schools where you can learn in Māori. There are bilingual schools. So, so over the years, New Zealand has been increasingly, you know, sort of seeing this as a relationship, a partnership between indigenous people and those of us who are clearly not, not indigenous, uh, to make New Zealand a country where, you know, both feel at home and indigenous people feel secure in their identity and their, their rights and are able to determine their future. So it is, it is an interesting experience. And as I've been traveling over the, the last couple of weeks, mostly in Latin America, the New Zealand experience uh, is looked to with great interest in Chile, where the Mapuche people uh, have significant uh, issues. It is also, uh, it could be relevant to Colombia which has over 100 indigenous groups, two thirds of which have kept their language, which is quite, quite remarkable. So uh, it could be of interest in, in Panama, it could be of interest in Costa Rica, it could be of interest in Guatemala, Nicaragua, with the mosquito people on the uh, Caribbean coast. It, it is of relevance. And uh, you know, New Zealand is always happy to share those experiences, and I find that on the Latin American continent, uh, our, our embassies there are often quite busy facilitating exchanges on these issues. For example, our ambassador in Chile, who is herself indigenous and is going home to be employed by the, the big corporation for her tribal area for, for a time, she has just gone with a delegation of Mapuche to the World Indigenous Business Forum, which is being held in New Zealand this week. So we do a lot in this area to facilitate exchange and for people, we don't say we're perfect, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes too, but we see it as a process and a, and a journey.
Yes, uh, you know, politics in New Zealand uh, was uh, very much a man's world when I went into it. Uh, the, the most uh, number of women MPs there had ever been at one time was four prior to my being elected, and this is in a parliament that was around 90 members. Um, and as I said before, when I was elected, we were 9%, that was eight of us uh, at, at the time in a 92-seat parliament. So uh, I, I have to say it wasn't a very welcoming environment and uh, you had to be quite resilient. Uh, there were also you know, no, no role models of, of top women's leadership in the country, only I think uh, before uh, before 1984, I can't think of more than three women who had ever been a cabinet minister in New Zealand. Uh, so when I went in, my aspiration was that one day I would be a minister because that looked like you know, the most you would ever achieve and you would never have thought of being prime minister because no one thought of it. Right? Um, and then, uh, well, when I was in Parliament, I was, I was a minister in the late 1980s uh, for three years and became Deputy Prime Minister. And then uh, when I had been a Member of Parliament for 12 years, I challenged for the leadership of my party. And because my party was one of the two major parties, uh, I won the leadership and uh, I became Leader of the Opposition. And at that point, uh, you know, the sort of gender issues that kind of simmered away um, in politics became much more blatant, if I could put it that way, because I came in for a kind of criticism that no man had ever experienced uh, in these top roles. And the criticism was all personal. Uh, it was about how you looked, your hair, your clothes, was your voice too low or too high? I mean. And, and then the, the sort of stereotypes of behaviour. So in men in politics, strength is always admired. But in women, strength can be turned around to being tough, <laughs> unpleasant, bossy, nagging, you know. So all of that was out there. And it was quite, it was quite difficult to, to push through that. It's sort of like a zone that you have to move through and be very resilient. And you can only move through that with a lot of support, a lot of support. I mean, your family, your friends, your networks, your political party, because you know it can seem like everybody is out, out to get you. And there was one point, uh, I was leader of the opposition for six years in New Zealand. I lost the first election I competed in, as, in that role. 
Um, at one point uh, in that first three years, my ratings as preferred prime minister, which are quite important ratings, were 2%, which is the death zone. So I had to climb out of the death zone, you know, just by being better, I guess, being professional and you know, keeping on, you know, keeping a focus on the long-term goal. So when I became prime minister, I'd by and large seen off these criticisms, so people, and, and also it helped that the governing party uh, had a, a party room coup d'etat and replaced their male prime minister with a woman. And so that, in a way, normalised that, that, that there was a woman prime minister and there was a woman leader of the opposition. We, we changed jobs at the next election. But uh, I, think, I think that was, that was helpful. I did notice uh, towards the end of my time as prime minister that some of the gendered criticism came back again uh, because you know, opposition are looking for an angle on you. And there were some you know, progressive things we did that they turned into you know, the bossy, nagging, telling you what to do kind of criticism again. I've also noticed that with our young woman prime minister, uh, she has been uh, you know, subjected to gender-based questioning, which is completely inappropriate. Like before the election, uh, a couple of the journalists and you know, significant media outlets demanding to know, would she have a baby if she was prime minister? Well, who asks men if they're going to have a family when they're prime minister? So there's all sorts of assumptions in there, aren't there? And, and so, I mean, she stood above this, but I challenged it. I said, what, what on earth is the reason for asking these questions? And their, their response is, oh, well, we need to know whether a prime minister will be on the job all the time, or will they be taking time out? And my response to that was, well, are you going to ask these men whether they might have a heart attack or a stroke and not be able to go to work? I mean, you know, I mean, so it was very gendered, gendered criticism. Um, and that, that hasn't really gone away because she's a, she's a younger woman because she has now had a baby. And most people are very positive about this, but it's still an angle of, 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 of criticism. So I think, you know, this is, this is the reality. Uh, for women at the top still. I mean, look at how Hillary was treated. You know, could anyone have been more qualified to be president than Hillary Clinton? And yet she was subjected, really, to, to 40 years of, of, uh, of denigration uh, with a significant gender-based element to it. Um, so we, we haven't won these battles yet. We have two words, two questions. Thank you very much. Um, my question would be, well, you spoke about the fact that when you um, aspired to become a minister, it was kind of very much out of the box to think that you would become a prime minister. So what kind of out of the box thinking do you recognize or identify today uh, might exist among some women or feminists um, that you support? Mm. Yeah, thanks so much for such inspiring views. Um, I'd like to draw the discussion slightly to women in science and other minorities in science. And um, well, I've heard many times the argument coming from conference organizers or hiring like uh, research group leaders who want to hire people. Um, and they say, well, you know, like this women or minority issue in science is like, in principle, it's important, but I'm worried about quality and I only want to invite the best speakers and it so happens that they're all men. Um, and I'd like to know what you would answer to that. Argument. Mm. Well, let me take that one first. I think men should refuse to go on all-male panels, right? No all-male <laughs> panels, hashtag. <laughs> uh, and secondly, I, I really think that uh, in these areas of study, which we often call STEM, right? Uh, science, technology, engineering, maths, uh, much bigger efforts have to be made to recruit and encourage women in. Uh, I've had some engagement uh, with the 
engineering faculty at my old university in Auckland, New Zealand recently, and they have a young progressive dean. Uh, he set a target to get 30% women in by 2020, because engineering has been a very male field in, in New Zealand. And I have said to him, you should now aim for 2030 and gender parity. You know, that's the sort of global agenda deadline. It, you know, it, it could be done. And what, what they are doing is looking at what are the reasons why women haven't been in engineering. And one of the issues is the image of the profession. Now, engineering has many different strands. Uh, but often when women think of engineering, they think of, well, those are the people who design bridges and highways. And, and often women are looking for a human element to what they do. So he recognises he has to try to, to humanise and feminise uh, the image of engineering as, as a relevant profession. So I think there's, there's much, much more that, c that could be done to get diversity in, 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 these, in these professions. Uh, so um, back to the first question about the out of the box. Um, I think that so much more is possible for women today. There are so many more role models of women doing things across the, across the board. Um, so their, their options aren't as constrained as they were for my generation. When I went to a, a girls' grammar school in Auckland, uh, in essence, girls were being educated for three possibilities. One was to be a teacher, one was to be a nurse, and one was to be a secretary. That was where people went from the girls' grammar school. But actually, we were so lucky to be in a generation where we were going to university in equal numbers with men. And once you got to the university, there were so many more choices. And I remember uh, when I went to the university, you tend to choose subjects in those days that you'd done at school. So I chose history and English literature uh, and, um, and, and German, because I studied uh, German at high school. But you could do a fourth subject. And I met someone who said, you know, political science is really interesting at the university. And I did po political science as my fourth subject, which was out of the box. <laughs> well, the rest is history, right? I ended up becoming a, uh, I did my master's degree in political studies, and I went on to be a lecturer, and that opened doors to have a political career. Uh, so I think, you know, the, these days, uh, young women, at least in Western countries, coming through schools, they see so many more choices. And, and there's no reason why they shouldn't aim to be the top of, of anything. I mean, you know, in our country, women have been the top of most things. I must say that the university sector is one of the most regressive. It's quite unusual to have a woman rector in a New Zealand university. Uh, I can think of only two at the current time, and, and they'd be among the first two, actually, in quite a regressive sector. And that, I think, needs, uh, needs some thought. Uh, but you know, building on the efforts of earlier generations, I think there's a lot more opportunity now uh, for girls and young women to think that anything's possible. I could do that. You know? Thank you very much for uh, the answers. We don't have time for, for more questions. I would like to invite uh, Professor Federico Mayor to, to close the, the session. It is a pity. It is a great pity, madam, to close this session because I was enjoying very much both the questions that you yourself have been discussing on and also the questions from the floor. Uh, I, I would like to uh, end this uh, colloquium, first of all, telling you that we need reference like you are because at this moment, if it's for the first time in the history, that we the peoples, as it is said in the first phrase of the United Nations Charter, we the peoples, we must take the reins of our destiny. We cannot uh, have any more the G6, G7, all these issues. We must now have a multilateral democratic system, very strong. And for this, we need examples, because otherwise people say, oh, this is impossible. No. Now, we must, for the first time, I think that what uh, uh, President Kennedy said uh, uh, three months before he was assassinated is now very important. He said that there is no any challenge beyond the distinctive capacity, creative 
of the human beings. Then we can invent the future. What you represent is this. What you represent, you said at the beginning you had very, very few percentage and you arrived to be Prime Minister. And that uh, when uh, you were Minister of Health, all that you are doing were in a new way of uh, vision. For this new vision, we need uh, examples like you in order to overcome. I would like only to, to uh, uh, underscore three points of your. One that is extremely relevant is related with the question of uh, Professor uh, Carlos Jimenez was on supremacism, on uh, how we can really uh, be all uh, the human beings equal in dignity. And you have mentioned the very, very important uh, advances in your country, but at this moment, you know that here in Europe and also in Latin America, mm. we have examples of the contrary. Mm. We have the examples, again, of supremacy. This is extremely dangerous. Very dangerous. Because history, we must learn from history that when uh, Hitler appeared and when Mussolini appeared and when Hirohito in Japan appeared, then we had a very, very important problem. And now we are having the same in Hungary, we, we are having in uh, Austria. We, this is one of the points that I consider that from your experience, mm. what you have said today is more important for all of us, mm. because we must realize that from now on, we must say no to the supremacism. You have been able to include the Maoris, you have been able to do so many important things at the respect. Now we cannot accept that in Europe, instead of having the example, the contrary examples, we are uh, allowing that some supremacism starts again. The second is uh, the uh, processes today for the first time in history, are potentially irreversible. You have been <laughs> a very wonderful, because I know this as former Director General of UNESCO, of uh, UNDP, and you know how important it is that uh, the uh, development, the sustainable development, human and sustainable development, that must be supported. And the generosity of uh, the different countries in, in a given moment was quite important. Also, in the United Nations, the UNDP was the most important uh, uh, pillar. Now, now uh, as you know, we are in a process of lack of solidarity. I think that it's terrible to imagine that in Europe in the year 2016, we have allowed more than 6,000 persons to die in the Mediterranean. All these things I consider that are extremely relevant. And uh, this demonstrates that today we have a lot of diagnosis. Mm. But as a molecular pathologist that I am, <laughs> I can tell you that now what we need is urgent treatment. Yes, treatment. <laughs> because otherwise tomorrow <laughs> can be too late. And uh, it's for this that I like also uh, your vision on the how to put into practice the agenda mm. Uh, 2030. You have been very, very clear. I would not like to deal on this, but only to remember all the uh, audience that every day, today, we invest more than $4 billion in military expenditures and in armament. Mm. At the same time, today, more than 20,000 persons will die of hunger yep. and extreme poverty in the world. This is intolerable. And to react in situations like this, again, again, the reference like you are very important mm. because we realize that now we, the people, we, we, we must also not to remain silent. Mm. Now, for the first time in history, we can talk. Mm. We can join your voice to your voice. Mm. After listening to you now, we can say mm. in, our, in our portable, in our mobile, mm. we can say what we think. This voice of the people, I consider, that is one kind of the hope mm. that we have after listening persons like you. Mm. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.